For the next four years, he immersed himself in ancient history and literature, as well as such English authors as Shakespeare, Milton, Swift, and Pope. Here also, like James Madison, who matriculate, matriculated after him, young Patterson took the required senior course in moral philosophy, a crucial transmission belt for the ideas that young men absorbed about human conduct. And usually that senior course was entrusted to the president of the college. It was in part through Princeton's curriculum that the writings of such eminent Scottish social theorists as Adam Smith Adam Ferguson and Thomas Reed entered American intellectual and public life. Even legal education was not exempt from this relentlessly bookish approach to learning. And I might note that there were no law schools in America in those days. I think the first one of the sort was in the 17, created in the 1780s. So most of the legal study was done through a kind of apprenticeship method, sitting in, the, in the, the office, perhaps, of a lawyer and reading the books in his study and so forth. Now, consider the course of study that Thomas Jefferson composed in 1767 at the age of 24 for a friend who was about to study to be a lawyer. Before you do Jefferson Consult, you must absolutely, that was his word, absolutely learn Latin and French and should become conversant with mathematics, astronomy, geography, and natural philosophy. Having laid this foundation, said Jefferson, his friend could properly embark on his quest. This, however, was only the beginning. With characteristic thoroughness, Jefferson next prescribed a systematic outline of study for his friend, including every single book that the would-be lawyer should read. Before 8 o'clock in the morning, and you heard me right, before 8 o'clock in the morning, he should employ himself in what Jefferson called physical studies, including agriculture, chemistry, anatomy, zoology, botany, ethics, natural religion, sectarian religion, and natural law. From 8 until noon, he should read law. From 12 to 1, he should read politics. During the afternoon, history. From dark until bedtime, he should concentrate on belles lettres, notice, notably Shakespeare, and on criticism, rhetoric, and oratory, particularly the orations of Demosthenes and Cicero. In other words, to obtain a satisfactory legal education by the standards of Jefferson, one should read books for 12 hours a day, and only a third of that time books about law. If Jefferson's advice appears manifestly utopian to us, one suspects that it seemed much less so to his contemporaries. Only 14 years before the future sage of Monticello offered his formidable regimen to his young acquaintance, another young American statesman in the making, John Dickinson, sailed to London for four strenuous years of legal studies. Rising daily at 5 a.m., he would read for nearly eight hours, dine at four o'clock in the afternoon, and then retire early in the evening. All the while, mingling his scrutiny of legal texts with such authors as Tacitus and Bacon. In 1757, his formal education complete, Dickinson returned to Pennsylvania and a distinguished career culminating in the miracle at Philadelphia. This then was the first influence that made the Founding Fathers the kind of readers they were. In 18th century America, education was a serious enterprise, entailing disciplined exposure to the great tradition of classical and enlightened learning. The colonial educational system imbued in its ablest matriculants a lifelong practice of diligent humanistic reading. Perhaps it is not so surprising that one of the Constitution's framers, Benjamin Franklin, was the inventor of bifocals. The second factor that profoundly affected the founders' reading was, of course, the political and social upheaval 
of which they were the architects and beneficiaries. The illustrious men whom we celebrate this week were contemplative activists engaged in a daring endeavor to which, you may remember, they had solemnly pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Under these circumstances, it is not so surprising that they repeatedly consulted the experience of the past, as recorded in works of history, law, and political theory, both to make sense of their current tribulations and to guide them in their epic task of nation building. In a letter to his wife in 1780, during the most dismal days of the American Revolution, John Adams explained why he read the genres of literature that he did. I must study politics and war, he wrote, that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. For Adams, you see, the kind of reading one permitted oneself in life was directly related to political concerns. The right to read books in the arts had to be earned. The Founding Fathers' interest in books as a means of understanding politics and war had become, had another less conservative dimension. Like many European men of learning in that age known to us as the Enlightenment, the Americans who met in Philadelphia in 1787 believed that human nature was both universal and immutable, and that through the comparative study of past civilizations, they could adduce the fundamental principles of human behavior. In other words, history, particularly the history of ancient republics, could yield pertinent lessons for men embroiled in fashioning the unprecedented, a self-governing republic on a continental scale. In short, by careful historical research, one could hope to gain an understanding of what Alexander Hamilton in Federalist No. 9 unabashedly called the science of politics. It was part of the founders' faith that the science of politics had advanced so rapidly in modern times as to render feasible their experiment in ordered liberty. If the founders, by education and circumstance then, were led to become active readers of books, an impressive number of them became collectors of books. In one respect, this should not surprise us. In the 1770s and 1780s, transportation in America was slow, and institutional repositories of knowledge rather few. Public libraries, as we know them today, did not exist. In a real sense, every man of affairs had to be his own librarian. Still, at least a few of the builders of the new nation did far more than what was minimally required for their own edification. Benjamin Franklin's personal library, for example, contained 4,276 volumes at the time of his death in 1790. George Washington's comprised nearly 900 volumes when he died nine years later, a figure all the more remarkable since he was much less of a reader than many. Even Patrick Henry, whose only formal education was provided by his father and his uncle, and whose forte was the spoken rather than the written word, assembled a respectable 150 titles, including both ancient and modern classics. How many Americans today, we might ask ourselves, have libraries that could compare with those? <laughs> 